All right. Looks like we're live. How's it going, everyone? Good. Good. Hey. Good. All right. So, okay. <laughs> We've got this Hollywood Square thing, so it's good. Uh, you know, we're at the end of the conference, uh, which is fun. Uh, thank you, everyone, for you know attending this TOC panel, basically to you know end the conference. You know, make sure that the TOC is approachable and everyone can kind of ask questions and you know things you can kind of learn about what's being planned for for the next year. So to kind of kick things off, um, I'll introduce you know myself. My name is Chris Anizik. I have the fun job of you know, serving the technical community uh, in CNCF. Um, you know, we have currently 10 uh, TOC members, um, you know, that will go throughout and introduce themselves. Um, I will call each of you out individually to kind of say hi and talk a little bit about your, you know, job and, and, and role. So to start things off, I'll just go uh, in order from what I could see. So we'll start with uh, Elena. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Elena Prokarczyk. I'm, uh, I work for Apple. There I help a different engineering team to onboard the cloud native infrastructure. Always excited to learn about the new use cases and you know, ways to improve the platform. And happy to be here. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Elena. I had a fun keynote uh, earlier uh, in the conference. Uh, next up for me is uh, Dave. Hey, um, I'm Dave. I'm an uh, engineer on Spotify's platform team. And I've done a bunch of work around our adoption of Kubernetes and gRPC and uh, Envoy work around the perimeter, bunch of things like that. Um, I think the newest TOC member on this board, so I'm still kind of fig figuring out what I do here and how to do it, but happy to be here. Cool. Th thank, thank you, Dave, uh, very much. Um, next up for me is uh, our TOC chair, Liz, Liz Rice. Hi. Yeah, so thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm Liz Rice. I look after the open source engineering team at Aqua Security. And uh, yeah, I'm chair of the TOC. And Dave, don't worry, we're all figuring out what we're doing as we go along. <laughs> Constantly iterate, it's the way it works. Um, next up is, uh, is Michelle. Hey everyone, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Awesome, I'm Michelle Neurley. Um, I am a software engineer here at Microsoft Azure. I work on open source tools um, in the cloud native ecosystem, focusing on making containers and Kubernetes easier to use. I am currently a core maintainer on the service mesh interface project and the open service mesh projects. And uh, previously I've worked on several other uh, tools in the cloud native space. I'm also an emeritus uh, maintainer on the Helm project. Happy to be here. Awesome, lots of projects there. Uh, next up is Saad. All right, thanks, Chris. My name is Saad Ali. I'm a software engineer at Google, and uh, my background has mostly been around storage for Kubernetes and the CSI project. And I'm very excited to be a part of the TOC and uh, see what I can do to help other projects as well. Thank you, Saad. Uh, Brendan uh, Burns is up next. All right, I fiddled with my sound settings, so hopefully yeah, it's not quite so loud. Uh, hi, I'm Brendan Burns. Uh, I work in Microsoft Azure uh, for a bunch of compute and cloud native services on Azure, as well as our upstream open source work. Awesome, thank you, Brendan. You don't sound like a lawnmower is going in the background, so uh, progress has been made. I think I was on my like built-in laptop mic and not my headset, so apologies. Yeah. <clears throat> awesome. Worries. All good. All good. Uh, next up is uh, Justin Cormack. Hi, I'm Justin Cormack. I'm an engineer at Docker. I'm a uh, maintainer of Notary, and I'm the maintainer elected representative on the TSC. I'm also very involved with SIG security and um, work on lots of security related stuff. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Matt Klein up next. Hey everyone, I'm uh, Matt Klein. I'm a software engineer at Lyft. I spend about 50% of my time on infrastructure leadership at Lyft, uh, and then I spend the other 50% of my time working on CNCF, Envoy, and all of the other fun stuff. Nice to be here. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and then Cheng? Hi, I'm Shen Liang. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Rancho Labs. And uh, we, uh, I think, as at Rancher Labs, we uh, we contributed a couple of uh, sandbox projects to CNCF so far, uh, Longhorn and K3S. 
and we look forward to uh, doing more uh, with you know with CNCF. Awesome, thank you, Zhang. I don't think uh, Zhang uh, from Ali um, is here, unless I'm wrong. I don't see him in my magical Hollywood Square. So, um, you know, we'll we'll continue. Um, you know, I'm gonna share my screen in a second here to kind of go over uh, our presentation. But uh, generally, we have 11 TOC members uh, currently. The TOC uh, is down to 10 because, um, you know, sometimes when you find an amazing person to hire, uh, you hire them and we, you know, ended up hiring uh, Katie Gamanji, who used to serve as the end user uh, <coughs> representative um, for the TOC. So we are down to 10. Let me go share my screen. Let's see if this actually works. Cool. All right. All good. Hopefully this works. So here is, um, you know, a wonderful TOC. Like, like I mentioned, we have 10. Um, you know, we usually have 11 when we have a full house, uh, you know, representing, uh, you know, end users, uh, GB appointed, uh, main, uh, you know, representatives and maintainer appointed uh, representatives, a good kind of cross section of the different communities we uh, serve. Um, you know, one thing that, you know, I constantly highlight uh, that a lot of people new to CNCF uh, generally don't understand is, you know, as a community, we have come up with a set of, you know, guiding principles that the TOC has produced um, that we publish on GitHub and we kind of, uh, you know, evaluate. It's been a while since we've done an update. We're probably uh, overdue to kind of take a second look at it. But if you kind of go through some of these principles, you know, we're always about putting projects, you know, first, uh, you know, projects are independent and self-governing. The foundation doesn't really meddle uh, with projects uh, along with TUC members, they're really there to advise and guide. Um, we're generally can, looking for, you know, high quality, well run projects. Um, you know, we kind of have a rule around, uh, you know, kingmakers. Uh, if you saw from, you know, Liz's wonderful keynote just uh, earlier, um, kind of highlighted uh, that point uh, around no kingmakers and, you know, one size not fit all. Uh, you know, even though we host things like specifications, you know, things like CNI, SMI, uh, we're, we're not a traditional standards body. So, you know, we're very much, you know, code first, uh, practical use, uh, and the kind of spec follows. Um, and really, you know, at the end of the day, we truly want to, you know, help, uh, you know, projects, uh, you know, uh, you know, above and beyond and what they could typically get, um, you know, from from a foundation. Um, so, you know, <laughs> during this whole KubeCon with, you know, 23,000 or so people are attending, uh, got pinged by, you know, you know, at least probably a couple dozen people like we want to think of bringing our projects to the, you know, CNTF. How does it work? You know, um, uh, good news is this year we've documented a lot of improvements um, when it comes to uh, processes. So uh, if you go to our documentation, especially our project proposals doc, uh, you'll find um, a lot of that information there. It's generally uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, we've made a lot of improvements around the sandbox process, so it's a lot easier now to um, uh, you know, propose projects and for the TOC to kind of deal with the inbound of requests. Um, on the bright side, uh, you can kind of see all the existing proposals. So if you're kind of new to this, please kind of, you know, look at the existing pro proposals out there and kind of get ideas and maybe attend one of the public TOC meetings um, that happen every couple of weeks uh, or just jump on Slack. Uh, we're super friendly and happy to, to, to answer any questions um, that you have. Uh, you know, as we're kind of, you know, wrapping up this year, you know, some of us uh, on, on the staff side, we've been working on an internal uh, report uh, or, you know, essentially the, a lot of data that feeds into our annual report that we'll publish in January. But one thing that kind of shocked me um, this year is that we actually accepted 35 uh, projects, uh, the, you know, super majority of them being in Sandpox, which if you kind of look at our history, um, it's by far the most we've ever accepted, um, you know, in a year in, in CNCF at all, which is a little bit, you um, a little bit wild, um, you know, we went through the expansion of uh, upping the TOC from, you know, 11 people total and got that fully staffed out uh, this year, which has been awesome. Uh, we improved the end user representation, which has been great. Uh, we added two new SIGs this year around uh, observability and also contributor strategy, which has been uh, great in kind of formalizing a lot of uh, ideas to help projects get started and just being great advisors outside of just the, the staff that usually handles the, the brunt of that work. Um, as I mentioned before, we simplified the sandbox projects, which, um, you know, uh, in the beginning, I think uh, I had some hesitations there, but generally it's uh, definitely improved uh, the acceleration in which we've accepted projects. So I think that's been a positive thing overall. And uh, as of this year, we also 
uh, you know, graduated five projects. So Helm Harbor, Taike V, Rook, and uh, for some of these, we're giving a bit, bit of a preview for next week, but Etsy D uh, will we'll graduate uh, next uh, next Monday or Tuesday, I believe. So it'd be great to kind of end the year with five projects hitting that, hitting that level. The big thing that I like to remind folks on, um, you know, the TOC is really staffed with community members, folks that kind of represent, um, you know, uh, the, the community, whether they're project maintainers, ambassadors, and so on. Uh, nominations for essentially six slots will be opening up uh, in January. Uh, we'll have um, six slots uh, and they'll represent different, uh, you know, kind of areas and, and, and designated slots that the TOC has. So two of them will be end user appointed. So this is from our uh, end user community that uh, Cheryl Hong runs. Uh, they'll be uh, working to appoint those. Uh, three of them will come from the governing board and one will be from the TOC itself gets to uh, appoint them. So we'll go through this whole process uh, and we'll be super public about it, remind everyone. So just pay attention. And if you're interested uh, in running, feel free to reach out to me or any other TOC members and they could kind of talk about the you know uh, time commitments, pros, cons, and all that wonderful stuff that happens with the role. Um, not really going to dive into predictions since Liz had a wonderful keynote uh, on this. Uh, I think we're going to, you know, kind of move back to Hollywood Squares and essentially start asking, you know, the TOC some questions uh, and, and, and so on. So uh, let me go stop sharing my screen here. So let's see if we could go back to Hollywood Squares mode. Awesome. Kind of see everyone here for the most part. Um, so uh, before I kind of kick off our uh, questions um, out there, um, you know, I'd love to kind of uh, see if, you know, Liz made all these kind of wonderful predictions, you know, around Kubernetes on the edge, WebAssembly, BF. Is there something that, uh, you know, uh, she potentially missed or glossed over that anyone wants to kind of, you know, uh, bring up, you know, bring up here? Any kind of thoughts on where we're going to uh you know go next year in terms of uh, predictions anyone want to jump in and, and and take this um go ahead brendan so uh i mean i say this every year i guess but um i think broadening the developer base in the cloud native ecosystem is, is critical um i think it's just too hard to build applications um and we've focused a lot of energy on operating applications and that's great um but like if we don't make it easier for people to build these applications, I don't think we're doing anybody a service. So I'm, you know, excited about bringing things like no code to Kubernetes and uh, other kinds of, you know, developer productivity that we can that we can focus on. So I'm hopeful. Every year I say we're going to do this, and we make some progress. But I'll keep saying it till we actually make full progress. Awesome. Definitely. I don't know if you saw, uh, there was some crazy person who hooked like Google Sheets to monitoring, like and editing a <laughs> Kubernetes cluster. Hopefully we'll, we'll see some innovation in, in this space to make it easier for, for everyone. Anyone yeah, else want sure. to take monitoring via Sheets is the, <laughs> the solution. <laughs> I was thinking more Quake. I like the Quake. I like monitor chaos yeah, engineering. Yeah, or chaos nodes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyone else want to take this? Uh, any other predictions for next year if we're going to dive into our normal uh, panel, did Liz miss anything? I've got something. Um, I think extensibility is something that uh, we've been driving a lot on in this community, and uh, I expect that's going to continue. I think uh, a lot of the standards that have emerged, like CSI, have uh, become well established and have allowed kind of a, a plethora of companies to, or, or solutions to be able to integrate together with the ecosystem. And so I expect that those extensibility points are going to continue to expand. Awesome. Do you have any particular areas you think that will? Like, yeah, what object like? storage was an interesting one uh, where, you know, data path has not really been standardized and we don't really have a good way to be able to plug in an arbitrary object storage. Uh, now the Kubernetes uh, folks are starting to look at a, co a container object storage interface. And what would that look like? Is it you know, going to be as uh, extensible as CSI has been in terms of being able to plug in an arbitrary object storage system to uh, an arbitrary workload on Kubernetes on any environment? Can we get to that point? And so that's an uh, interesting and exciting kind of frontier that's being explored. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Um, 
I will move on to our set of questions uh, and then I'll go check, um, you know, in, in Slack to see if anyone has anything in particular. But to kind of kick off our, our kind of first, uh, you know, question, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start with um, you know, essentially the, the service mesh, you know, space. So, you know, CNCF has a, you know, a handful of projects in the service mesh ecosystem, you know, uh, Kuma, SMI, Linkerd, uh, Envoy, even though Matt's completely keeps yelling at me that Envoy is not a service mesh. Maybe you could talk about that. What do you think, you know, what do you predict kind of happening, you know, in, in this space? There seems to be a lot of approaches. Um, there's a spec now, um, you know, what, what do you kind of see happening uh, in, in, in the service mesh space uh, next year? I'll start with Matt first since. <laughs> thanks for, thanks for putting me yeah. on the spot. Yeah. Um, and yes, Lord. Envoy is not a service mesh. I just want to say that again, <laughs> Envoy is not a service mesh. Um, you know, I, uh, I like people ask me this all the time and I'm going to be honest, I don't know what the answer is. And I, I think I don't know what the answer is because service mesh is not a very mature space right now. There's lots of different solutions. I'm, I'm personally obviously very biased. I think the data plane is converging on Envoy, but I just think we we're seeing a proliferation of components out there in the control plane space. And, I always step back to what are the problems that people are trying to solve. And I think this comes back to what Brendan was actually saying, which is that we're building a lot of infrastructure, but it's still too hard to write applications. And from the end user perspective, they don't actually care how load balancing and retries and all of these things are implemented. So it's, it's somewhat of an implementation detail. And I think that as we move forward over the next few years, we're just going to be looking at more integrated platforms that that bring together uh, how we how we deploy applications, how we connect to various systems like APIs and PubSub, et cetera. And I, I just don't I don't actually foresee a future in which we're going to keep going down this independent service mesh path. I think users are going to come to expect a set of features and whether that comes from projects like Knative or other serverless platforms, um, and, you know, I, I think they'll be using projects like Envoy and Kubernetes under the hood, but I'm actually personally very skeptical that we're going to continue to see a bunch of these independent projects. I think over time, we're going to see some of them go away. Some of them are going to get merged into larger, uh, larger projects and systems. So, so is there, you know, no hope for Envoy to be rewritten in Rust over the next couple of, of years? Wow, you're just you're just trying to get a rise out of me during this event. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> give me a hard time. <laughs> Do you actually want me to answer that? Absolutely. Why? Why not? Absolutely. Uh, uh, I, I think that over time we will, uh, I'm not a, I'm not a big believer in a complete rewrite Envoy is hundreds of thousands of lines of code and uh, with millions of lines of dependencies. So I don't think it's realistic to do a complete rewrite. I do think that over time via things like WebAssembly and embedding Rust, and I, I think we will see Envoy, you know, start to use those types of systems, but no, I, I don't think we'll ever do a complete rewrite. Yeah, so probably yeah. Like less Lua, more uh, more WebAssembly. Yeah, I think less less Lua, more uh, more WebAssembly. I think we will end up using Rust within Envoy. I think over time it'll be a mix of C plus plus and Rust. Um, but you know that's that's something that's going to evolve over the next couple of years. I mean, there's hundreds of millions and billions of lines of C plus plus. So I, I think there's a general problem out there that we're not going to rewrite the world, and we have to figure out how to gradually migrate to safer systems. Definitely. We are, Justin, we are, yeah, yeah we, we, are, we are seeing more rust in the cloud native space, which is exciting. We've, the security space has really adopted rust and we're seeing um, things like Parsec and Sandbox. And there's a lot of interest in rust there. Um, and, and, you know, we, um, you know, so we, there's a bunch of rust projects and there's a bunch of interest in rust. And I think there's a lot of, um, I think we'll see a lot more over the next year because a lot of people, you know, I talk to in the space are adopting it for these projects. So I think yeah, it's there's a lot of promise there. Yeah, definitely. I, I see it more popping up uh, more and more, but, you know, very, very little in, let's say, production uh, as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, anyone else on the topic of Rust while we're while we're there before I dive into another question? 
No, but on the topic of service mesh, um, I yeah. did want to highlight that uh, We just. Uh -oh. I think we lost Michelle. Yeah, I think we lost Michelle's audio. She, she was going to make such like a just salient point on uh, <laughs> that. That's okay. Uh, we will uh, fill the space with a less amazing point about service mesh than Michelle's was going to be. I know. I was uh, so uh, so thrilled. <laughs> Go ahead, dude. <laughs> Uh, I will try to give us 50% of Michelle's awesomeness. Um, I think for us, the bigger thing is something, uh, kind, of, kind of the point that Matt was making more, I think, about Envoy, that for us, talking about service mesh has been really hard because kind of most of the company doesn't care. They just want some feature of service mesh. So for us, it's been really hard to go around the company and talk about like, oh, I don't know, insert service mesh technology here, do we care? And very few people across the company building features care. What they care about is that they get retries or fault tolerance or some other interesting routing pattern that we can get from a service mesh. But it's very rarely that anyone says like, hey, platform team, give me a service mesh. Yeah. Definitely cool. All right. So uh, I think Michelle may be back on. So maybe you could follow up. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You're back. Let's hope this works. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, SIG Networking has been working on a conformance suite for SMI, and uh, that's a really exciting thing, because whenever conformance comes around um, and, and people work on it, that means you know multiple people are trying to implement one thing and kind of converging in a space, and I think uh, in the service mesh space, like, I mean, like everybody else has echoed, like it's really about the feature set, not really about the actual implementation. And so, and, and in the greater cloud native community, we've just been building these modular interoperable components, um, kind of working our higher level, like top, we were you know, to so eventually well. end up. <laughs> to eventually end up building uh, a really good experience for end users um, and, and eventually getting to that point where they can just be like, hey, like I just want retries and fault to tolerance and a really easy and seamless AB experience. Like I think since 2015, people have been asking like, how do I do AB testing in cloud native or Kubernetes environments? How do I do canary deployments? So um, once we get to a point where people are like, this is easy. I think that'll be a success. And I hope we get closer to that in the next year and see more tools being built and coming out of cloud native um, uh, computing foundation that are uh, really at that um, higher level and, and focusing on the experience rather than the details. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. It uh, looks like we finally have some great uh, audience participation here from someone. Uh, just throw this to the audience. I'm um, also happy to answer it. Um, are early stage projects built by individuals likely to be accepted in the sandbox, or is it more about vision or project maturity, number of contributors, feature sets, stability, and so on? Anyone want to take a, take a step? Yeah, I can, I can, I can take a of it. Oh, Liz, go. Okay, <laughs> see if we say something similar. Yeah, so um, the CNCF offers this neutral ground for collaboration. Um, and we do want to be a good place for people to come together and build great projects. It's not necessarily going to make sense to have one person come along with an idea. Um, you know, there, there is a cost associated with, you know, the work to host every project. So. I would say that when we see people from different organizations wanting to come together, it's nearly always going to be a no brainer that if, if it's cloud native and there are multiple organizations, it makes sense for them to have a neutral place to do that work. And if they don't have that neutral place, they can't do that work in many cases. Whereas for an individual, there isn't really a blocker preventing them from going on with their project and building up a bit of traction and making sure that it's, um, you know, something that is going to suit the community. Somehow, by almost by definition, having multiple organizations collaborating, that makes it uh, more likely to be a community relevant project, I would say. Brendan, was that anything like what you were going to say? 
Yeah, I think that was basically what I was going to say as well, which is that, you know, we're not GitHub, right? We're, we're not a project hoster. Um, and we're, what we are about is facilitating collaboration. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that, you know, while we have projects that are sort of led by single companies, um, they tend to, a, a, a project that's led by a single company tends to have a higher bar in terms of number of users uh, or number of sort of or importance. I mean, I think there's, etcd is a great example of a very important project where there was relatively few contributors and it was basically from one or two companies, but it still was important to have it. So it, it's not like it's a hard and fast rule, but it, but I think that, um, the, you know, if you're talking about fast path or easiest way to do it, build up a bunch of people who want to collaborate on something, and and it's pretty much becomes an obvious thing to add if people are interested, and it fits the cloud native ecosystem. And if I could add one more thing, um, I just wanted to kind of highlight that the sandbox um, process of getting into the sandbox has changed over the last year. I think earlier we kind of had this tension between. You know, the projects that we led into the CNCF had to meet a high bar in terms of adoption and extensibility and security and stability and all of these things. But at the same time, we want to be a home for, uh, like Liz said, uh, innovation and collaboration for new projects uh, for, for, uh, to, to provide kind of a neutral home for multiple companies and individuals to come together and be able to try new things. Uh, and I think the old process was a little bit at odds with that. So the, the new uh, sandbox project, uh, the new sandbox um, process has uh, really allowed for kind of more, more projects to get in. And uh, like, like Chris mentioned, I think we got 35 projects in this year. Definitely. So I guess to kind of summarize that is, you know, I don't think it's a no if you wanted to try to submit a project that was only one person, you'll get feedback eventually from the TOCs though. But I think in general, the, you know, a discussion to be had, each kind of project is looked at individually on, on, on its merits. Um, other questions. So, you know, I've been, um, you know, meeting with, uh, you know, telcos, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, heavily for the last couple of months. And there's kind of a lot of discussion around, you know, Kubernetes on the edge, Kubernetes, you know, you know, in smaller form factors, you know, you know, what are people's thoughts on the TOC? You know, are, are we going to see, you know, something like what happened with the Linux kernel where over time, just lots of different people stretching in interesting directions and moving into two new form factors and so on, you know, what, what role do you think Kubernetes will have, you know, on the edge? We have multiple, let's call them tiny distros, K3S now and K0S, I, I saw this this uh, this week. Uh, things like CubeEdge, uh, I think Microsoft announced something called Acri recently. There's a bunch of these things popping up um, all over. Does anyone kind of have thoughts on the role that you know Kubernetes and will play in the edge, and like what, what potentially the TOC could kind of do to um, you know help fulfill uh, Kubernetes and cloud native on on the edge? Justin. I would like to take. Oh, sorry, you go. <laughs> Let's get Justin, then Elena, and then anyone else can raise their hand. Yeah, I mean, I th I th when I talk to people, they all definitely want it. It's like there's huge demand for Kubernetes on the edge. And I think that therefore it's, you know, it's inevitable that we will get lots of that. What I like is that we've we've let in a bunch of quite experimental projects that are doing Kubernetes on the edge in really different ways. And I think there's a, because there's a lot to learn because I think I, I think we don't know what the architecture of it's going to look like and I think it's great to experiment with these lots of different ways of doing it and I'm I'm really looking forward to you know that shaking out as more and people actually get it into production because it's mostly experiments at the moment and mm -hmm. mostly little projects and getting to know that and exploring it with customers so I think over the next year we should get a really good idea of the things that work and don't work. Elena? Yeah, from the end user perspective speaking, uh, all users are looking for, they're looking for a universal way of delivering their applications to uh, to different locations, whether it's a platform in your organization or something, something on the edge. Uh, and that's where uh, Kubernetes on the edge really strikes. As for implementation, so we have Kubeage, OpenYard, uh, we have uh, K3S. Some challenges they share, some challenges, and uh, some are unique to the project. So I'm just curious to 
to look at them um, and just you know um, see uh, for the shared challenges uh, what what can be uh, what can be improved and for the new ones like for every new project it's always important to look and see like what what differs it from other from other edge projects that are already a part of CNCF what unique it brings to the ecosystem. Anyone else have any other thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, if I could, if I could say something, this is a, this is one of the. I think this was the first. This is the first prediction that in 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 the in the in the you know what's going to happen in twenty twenty one. I think all of us believe it holds tremendous potential. I I wouldn't. I'd love personally. I'd love to see a lot more. Uh, uh, it's very experimental. I'd love to see a lot more projects. I'd be you know. As TOC would always ask you, what makes you different and and what's unique? But but a lot of these things you you don't really know until until you start working on it and and engage the users, engage the community. So I definitely would engage would would encourage folks to to come up with with new distros or or, or new projects because this there are just so many ways to to do the same thing and it's just the standard is just not there yet. Awesome. We have uh, a few minutes left. I kind of want to leave the last question for uh, you know most of our end users, but you know other other folks on the TSA can answer this. You know, I've been working with a lot of different end users companies recently. I helped bring uh, an organization called the FinOps Foundation, the Linux Foundation, which is mostly dedicated to you know wrangling cloud financial management. For some of us, you know, who may work at a cloud provider, you kind of have this notion of cloud privileges, like everything's like free pretty much. But, you know, if you're working at maybe, you know, Spotify or, you know, smaller company, this stuff could get fairly, you know, expensive, uh, you know, quickly. And the tools to kind of manage bills or predicting the cost of spinning up a service just seems not to be there. Does you know, anyone have any thoughts of, you know, how this space may evolve or what, what, what could be done here? Because we actually don't have many projects at all in CNCF in the space. I don't really care about this problem, but I don't know, maybe Dave or, you know, Apple's a fairly well-off company, so maybe cost is less of a concern there, but, you know, I don't know. It's always a concern. It is always a concern, I think, no matter how big is your company. <laughs> um, so yeah, capacity planning is definitely, is definitely challenging. And uh, to be honest, uh, I don't know, like what are what are the tools out there that can solve everything? Like we are building something internally, but I would be happy to see more tools uh, evolving in the space because it's a shared problem, right? No matter how big your company is, um, you need to spend your money wise and do the and do the planning carefully. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I agree. That's I think that's a that's a good point. Yeah, one yeah. small thing yeah. that I would add. Oh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say quickly that from my experience, one of the biggest problems that people face in this space is not only the tooling, um, but actually tagging people's tagging people's resources to figure out how to do cost attribution. And there's a couple of companies that are in this space right now. And what I'm actually hopeful of is that we can develop a shared standard, something something like cloud events, uh, but actually related to cost attribution. And I, I think that having that type of API will make it much easier to have tooling across platforms like Kubernetes and, and other cloud providers that can help us figure out, you know, first how to tag everyone's resources because without having the resources tagged, it's virtually impossible to make any progress here. And then once that's in place, and I'm hopeful that can be an open standard, then I think there can be companies and there can be tooling on top that can help people actually with, with cost cutting. Yeah, and it's a bit of a perverse incentive because, like, the cloud provider is made, you know, you know, quote unquote, not care about the problem. Give it right. Out. Yeah, this is a <laughs> this is a complex topic and not not one that I really want to be recorded about. But happy to talk with anyone about this at any time. <laughs> I think Dave had something to to say here. Let's wrap it up as kind of the last uh, thought and, and comment before we we close the panel uh, on. <laughs> Sure, I guess the biggest thing I'll say is the same thing that Matt just ended with, that like, there's only so much I'm gonna say recorded, but I'm totally happy to talk to anyone about this. And just like Alina said, Spotify has built a bunch of internal tools for things like this, whether it's predicting or even just understanding and uh, labeling or cost attribution, all of that stuff. We've tried to open source some pieces of that, uh, but I would love to turn as much of that as possible into an open standard, like Matt was saying. And like, instead of each company building their own thing that does 10% of the job poorly, let us come together and build something that does much more of it better. 
Awesome. Yeah, d- d- definitely. I, I think, you know, that could be an exciting area that uh, if people have projects in that space, uh, please uh, contribute them. We'd love to kind of um, hear from you. So with that, you know, wrapping up um, our 30 minutes or so, I'd like to thank all of our uh, panelists. Um, you know, uh, you know, folks are definitely, you know, busy, but everyone is very approachable. So feel free to, you know, jump in on TOC meetings. We nearly have, you know, you know, 70 to sometimes even 100 people on these things. So uh, please jump on them and then submit any projects you have. We're, we're happy to help you. So thank you, everyone, for taking the time. Uh, you know, keep cons and wild and uh, please, you know, follow us on, on Slack, Twitter, and whatever communication meeting we prefer. So thank you all. All right. Take care.